Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is, I, I entitled this project in a, in a rather grandiose manner, really. I, I called it uh, uh, a consideration of medieval and renaissance planning at Falcon Palace. And actually, it's, it's really a piece of work that sprung out of a much smaller piece of work, which was very limited recording uh, of the East Range, the ruined East Range at Falkland. So the real trigger for the project was uh, conservation work that was required uh, on the East Range. We had to provide a pre-intervention record, uh, a record of the building before repairs took place, um, which would hopefully also provide a little bit more information uh, in terms of understanding the development and chronology of the of the East Range, um, particularly the um, the western facade of the East Range. So, just for those that haven't uh, visited Falkland recently, this is the an aerial photograph that shows the main site. Uh, the East Range is, is this building. Uh, an obviously named South Range there. The North Range, which survives really just as footings and is little understood, uh, appears to be a hall. And then to the north of that, um, from both excavation and what is exposed, we have the remains of uh, a later building, uh, dating to around about 1600, and an earlier castle. You can just see the circular towers in the plan there. They're actually underneath the uh, sort of tree cover, which you can see on the aerial photograph. And that is the actual East Range. Um, the main surviving element uh, being the, the Western Elevation, a remarkably ornate uh, bit of architecture. Now, there were two stages um, to the work. The first stage consisted of uh, a measured survey and a uh, photographic recording in advance of the rigging at pointing. And the second stage was more detailed analysis of the fabric and enhancement of that measured survey um, and, and a more detailed photographic record of some of the, uh, some of the features that we identified. Just to put Falkland into a bit of, bit of a historical context for you, uh, in case you're not familiar with its history. I mentioned that there was a castle on the site, um, certainly established by the early 14th century, possibly a little earlier. It was held by the Earls of Fife, uh, part, of, part of the uh, Clan Duff. Um, subsequently, um, it was taken over by the Scottish Crown. It was confiscated by the Scottish Crown. But of that earlier castle, um, I mentioned the towers, and you can see them on the ground today. Um, one has been rather elegantly uh, consolidated, and the other remains as an interesting pile of disarticulated stonework, <coughs> which gives you a, a sort of continuum of contrast of the various techniques of uh, conservation. Once the site was confiscated by the Crown, um, it would appear that certainly King James II and his Queen developed the site as palace. So instead of being referred to in the primary documents as a castle, you get references to uh, palatial works. There's a quite a few quite significant works which are documented in the Exchequer Rolls. Unfortunately, they're not always very explicit about what's actually being done. You have references to the carriage of stone, carriage of timber. You have a, a carpenter working there. But they don't necessarily say uh, what building's being worked on. So James the Fourth, moving forward a little bit, um, he's really the monarch that's credited with establishing the format, the layout of the palace as we see it today. Um, he, it is thought that he creates all these sort of barrel vaulted basements uh, to the south and east ranges, and the, probably was responsible for building the north range, the, the hall. So just returning to this drawing again, 
virtually everything in terms of its footprint is, is normally credited to James the Fourth. Um, including this rather fine surviving South Range, although subsequently further embellished uh, by James V, who we will move on to. Um, this is uh, a period in which the Exchequer roles are rather more illuminating about what works are being undertaken and when, and we know that there's a major exercise to remodel the gatehouse, uh, the, uh, both the South and East Ranges are um, enhanced, shall we say, and in, in part rebuilt. The gatehouse is completed in 1541. Work of the uh, Mason John Brownhill. The South Facade of the South Range reworked with the addition of five carved figures by Peter Flemishman. You might be able to guess where he's from in 1539. And the north uh, facade of the South Range receives, receives an additional uh, set of galleries uh, in stone uh, against the existing range, against the existing chapel range. And this incorporates these lovely little circular rondels which have got um, portraits in, all very much uh, of, a, of a, a, what is best described as Renaissance bling. He also undertakes alterations to the East Range which I'll come back to uh, in just a minute. So just to give you some illustrations of that, this is the South Range. So those are the, are the five statues incorporated into the buttresses there, and that's the gatehouse in its final James V form, although, again, incorporating uh, earlier fabric, and the South Range itself is actually uh, an earlier building and as I said, embellished uh, with, this, uh, with these Renaissance trappings. Internally, this is the north elevation of the, um, of the South Range. That's the gallery with its little round rondels between the, the windows with portraits on. And this thing with the lead roof is, is actually a two-story gallery. And then if you just look on the back of the gatehouse, so you might be able to see a row of corbels suggesting that either that gallery or a previous gallery uh, extended along the back of the gatehouse. And then the East Range itself, uh, again, it's, it's an updating of an existing structure, more uh, Renaissance bling with the addition of these buttresses um, and other decorative elements, which I'll come back to in a little bit more detail in just a minute. And finally, just for the sake of completeness, just so we've uh, gone through the history of Falcon at high speed, uh, part of the site is granted to David Murray, who builds um, a mansion and garden on the site of the castle, probably incorporating elements of the castle. And that building is later known as the Nether Palace or the, uh, or the Lower Palace. Unfortunately, 1654, the palace is used to garrison Commonwealth troops, and the East Range goes up in flames, and hence it's rather ruined condition today. And then, uh, from the 19th century, we see a whole series of campaigns of restoration, and particularly the third Marquess of Duke between 1887 and 1900 does a considerable amount of rebuilding work, so that when you look at the fabric today, it's actually quite difficult to work out what is reconstruction whether it's accurate reconstruction, and what is uh, original fabric. In terms of possible pictorial evidence that we can look at for the history of the East Range, if we go to the other side of it, um, if we go to the east side of it, uh, you can see in this rather dark slide that it's, it, it, from that perspective, it's in quite a, a ruined condition, although this building, which is uh, the cross range, built, rebuilt by the Marcus of Butte. Um, I'd like you to keep that in your heads, keep that uh, in your memories, because that's a good reference point when looking at some of the historic uh, representations we've got. This is the earliest from 1639, a rather distant view of the palace. It's in there, 
if, if nothing else, on this rather dark side, you might be able to just see the gable wall there of the East Range with a pitched roof and then a, a section of flat roofing. And that section of flat roofing is covering uh, what was a, a long gallery, an indoor exercise area, um, essentially, uh, becomes a popular feature of the great houses, certainly in the British Isles by the 14, 1490s. We go forward a, back, uh, a bit to uh, 1693, and that's this view again from the east. There's the cross house, which you saw on the on, on modern photograph. By now, we've just got a, a, a ruined building. We've got some gables, which are part of the east facade. We've got something along the bottom here with a whole series of window openings, continuing this way. And then out here, we've got this uh, suite of buildings, which is the uh, Nether Palace, which we've uh, almost completely lost. <coughs> this uh, contemporary view um, is slightly misleading, to say the least. It's looking towards the um, it's looking towards the South Range. There, so there's the gatehouse. This is the East Range, which is the subject of our discussion. But you'll notice it suddenly, although this drawing is of the same date as the previous one, it's suddenly acquired a roof and all sorts of embellishments. So, also, if you look at the scales of figures in relation to the building you might want to query the, the accuracy of that drawing. A lot of these artists which are, are drawing these uh, palaces, great houses, of course, they're, 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 be, they're providing an illustration to a client that wants to exaggerate the beauty and importance and significance and scale uh, of many of these places. Finally, from 1699, uh, we have this plan of the Nether Palace by Alexander Edward. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't provide as much information on the East Range, which is right down here. We just get the tail end of it, just the, the northern end of it. If we slap that onto a 1930s plan, you can see it just gives us a little bit of information about the arrangement at the end. Um, the northern end uh, at uh, ground floor level. So let's have a look at this uh, building in a little bit more detail. Um, as I mentioned, it's uh, quite embellished. Uh, when you start looking at it a little bit more closely, what you realize is that underneath all this embellishment in these nice windows, there are earlier features, block window openings there and there. And when you look at some of these first floor uh, windows, you find some of them have got little arches above, some of them haven't. There's all sorts of discrepancies uh, in the fabric, which at a glance you can see, but trying to put that together and try and understand what's happened is, is, is quite a challenge. So what we did is drew it all, or rather drew part of it. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned, the conservation works were concerned with the lower part of the wall. So that was the bit that we did on a stone by stone basis, but we did record the rest of the elevation uh, in outline. And it's a lot clearer on here. You can see in the upper floor there these little block window openings. Uh, you can see that there's various interventions and cut lines, little cut lines around where the buttresses have been put in. So if we go through this process of peeling away um, all the work that, um, all, the, all the alterations to that facade, we can identify all the stuff in green as being, uh, being the alteration. So a window is inserted there. These rondels, which you also get on the south elevation, are all inserted. These upper windows, these moments and transom windows, are inserted and the little windows are blocked off on the ground floor. Not quite so much alteration, <coughs> but you get the odd window being inserted, uh, a doorway being blocked up, and such like. 
So you can kind of peel away all that later intervention. That later intervention, uh, the dating of it, is uh, rather conveniently labelled because on the buttresses we have James V's cipher and a date of 1536, which suggests that's close to the completion date of that alteration. So James, James V is clearly uh, working that building over. Um, what, what might be going on inside? Well, we think, and this is a, a drawing that uh, John Dunbar did, actually, um, we think we've probably got a Queen's suite at the southern end, King's suite at the northern end, uh, a long gallery, um, which ultimately would have provided access to the Great Hall, um, the what we call the deus end, the high end of the hall here, lit, by a pair of oriel windows. So as the monarch and consort enter the Great Hall, they are bathed in light. Uh, and then th th this end, not on this drawing, but we do, there is some evidence to suggest there were a pair of opposed doorways, the typical arrangement of the medieval hall, suggesting this is the screened passage end, so there would have been some sort of screening off of this end of the building. And then what we're missing, of course, is all the service buildings that might have gone with the hall, such as the kitchen, the buttery, pantry, bakehouses, and such. But it's quite possible that the date we're talking, uh, 1530s, that the, the, uh, the former castle buildings might have incorporated some of those service buildings. Um, James, v, James V's scheme was sort of completed, as I, as I mentioned, with that gallery, which runs along the back of the chapel and along, possibly on the back of the, uh, of the gatehouse as well. So that's fairly well understood. What isn't quite so clearly understood is what the building might have been like before James V applied his Renaissance bling to it. So this is a, a drawing which takes away all those alterations and returns it to an earlier state, the date of which I'll come back to uh, in a moment. So it looks quite different, much more austere. Uh, first of all, we do have these very fine windows. Windows disappeared there, that was a later insertion. Uh, uh, projection there for a, um, a flue, fireplace at that end of the building. Series of door openings and windows on the ground floor. Uh, rather more of these little windows surviving at the top which we've identified from internal evidence. And within the fabric, we had evidence for some sockets running along about that level, suggesting there was some sort of gallery or platform on the exterior of the building. We had some scarring in the stonework there, suggesting the position of a staircase. So it looks as though we've got some sort of internal gallery on the courtyard side of the East Range. Now what we don't know, because the evidence disappeared, has, seems to have disappeared, is whether that gallery extended all the way along. So this would be an open gallery that is probably roughly roof height. You'll notice actually when you look at the window positions for the upper floor, the little windows, they don't seem to marry up particularly well with the fairly regular rhythm of the first floor. <clears throat> that probably didn't matter, it probably didn't jar, because if you've got a roof in the way, you wouldn't have read those windows in conjunction uh, with those windows. Significantly, we also have um, further evidence for access arrangements. So not only do we seem to have some sort of timber gallery here, we have um, a doorway, which is then converted into a window by James V, and a further doorway right at the end here. And from internal evidence, there appears to be uh, an internal partition between those two areas of the building. Things start getting a bit complicated when you look at that on the inside uh, of the structure and realize that, in fact, it started life as a window, was then made into a doorway, and then was converted back into a window. So um, 
fickle, these monarchs, aren't they? They, they seem to like uh, fiddling around with their, with their palaces. So how does that uh, pan out in terms of internal planning? Well, we've actually got to divide this early phase to the East Range into two, two sub-phases, as I mentioned, with windows and doors going backwards and forwards in terms of um, how they're being used. So uh, uh, the first bit of that phase seems to be a much narrower range. The gallery that we see on James V's building doesn't seem to be there in this early phase. So it looks as though this building was the gallery. So this is the gallery itself. It, didn't contain, it might have contained apartments at either end. As I mentioned, there does seem to be a fireplace heating a chamber at that end, and there is some evidence for uh, a chamber at the, at the uh, southern end there. Otherwise, it seems to be a fairly open space. So ignore galleries and chapels and such like uh, on that. It, the implication seems to be that the royal apartments uh, in this earlier plan of the palace site are in this area somewhere, and that this is a very ostentatious way and means of the uh, monarch and consort approaching the Great Hall. Now, I said there's sort of two sub-phases there because that timber gallery I mentioned on the south courtyard, or, or, sorry, on the courtyard side itself, looking at the socket holes, the ones that we can see, they seem to be insertions. So what we think is the window going to the doorway, going back to the window again. When it became a doorway, that's the point at which this timber gallery is created. So the East Range does appear to have a, a slightly more complex history than one initially thinks looking at uh, James V's um, interventions. And the problem is, who's responsible for this uh, original building? I mean, it's, it is often said, and as I mentioned this right at the beginning of this uh, talk, that James IV is often credited with the original palace layout that we see today. However, there's, there's all these tantalizing references in the Exchequer accounts about halls, chambers being partitioned off, and chambers being par partitioned off within the gallery, uh, and construction of stairs down to, to, down to lawns and such in the 1450s and 1460s, some 50 years earlier. Um, and in fact, after after James II's death, in, in many cases, we're seeing quite substantial works uh, being undertaken at the palace by um, the then, obviously, Queen Mother. So what I'm suggesting is that we might have a mid-15th century long gallery in a rather battered state surviving at Falkland Palace. Now, why could that be significant? Well, it's the first documented example of a long gallery in the British Isles. And if, and it is a big if, if we're right, it's the earliest surviving example of a long gallery in the British Isles. So it suddenly becomes a very, very uh, important building. So is there any other evidence to point us in the direction of a, a mid-15th century date? Well, James II's uh, consort, and then later the uh, Queen Mother, Marie, um, her background was at the Burgundian uh, court, that she spent a lot of her early life there. And in Burgundy in France, of course, by the mid-15th century, you have buildings, you have long galleries and such like, so she would have been well aware of this uh, sort of structure. So she comes to Scotland, uh, 
if you like, at the be beginning, really, of the uh, Renaissance in Scotland, and perhaps she is introducing some of these architectural ideas. She's bringing some of these architectural ideas uh, with her, and therefore we have the first uh, example of Long Gallery. So, in conclusion, from a fairly limited little bit of archaeological recording, fabric recording of the East Range, um, we garnered a surprising amount of information. And I would say the building merits much more uh, detailed recording because there is so much evidence on the interior of the building in terms of wall scars, sockets, possible positions of fireplaces and such like, which I think might certainly refine our understanding of the building further, but might remove my ifs uh, and might be's uh, from what I've uh, been, been saying. Thank you very much. <laughs>